Praise the Lord. Good morning, family. And good morning to those of you who are joining us from across the nation, around the world, and across the street. We're glad to have you with us. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of access called prayer, that we can come boldly, with confidence, not to the throne of judgment, but to the throne of grace, that we can obtain help in the time of need. Thank you for the relationship that you established through Jesus Christ, that we can be called the children of God, born anew, born afresh, born again of your spirit and your word. Thank you for this community of faith. Thank you for churches around the world who are celebrating you, celebrating Christ this morning or tonight. Bless us as we grow together, fellowship together, learn together and experience you together. Bless us, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Come on, greet three people around you, and then you may be seated. We're working our way back to normal. It's just like... Praise the Lord. God bless. <laughs> That's okay. So let me ask the question. How are you? Yeah, that's what I want to hear. I know what church you go to. It's funny if, you, if you're some, wherever you may be and you hear the words grace and peace. C, C, C. So some housekeeping very quickly. Um, we have our summer youth retreat. August 15th to the 19th, ages 12 to 19. Registration closes on August 1st, so make sure that you get your child in. And uh, you can go to the, the events page on our website, and there's information available. Praise the Lord. Pastor Jamal PJ is in Knoxville, Tennessee, ministering this morning. After tuning in to the first service to be inspired, and uh, he's probably going at it right now. So praise the Lord. I want to I want to jump right in because there was there was one element that I didn't get to in the first service that I want to get to in this service. So don't tell him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I want to pick up from, from last week, and much of this was inspired by controversy created by something that one particular minister said uh, about tithing. The last time we had this kind of controversy in the body of Christ here, in America at least, is 15 years ago in 2007 where it became so intense that Wall Street Journal decided to weigh in on the controversy, and they did a big article uh, around the issue of giving, around tithes and offering. Uh, pastorally, as your spiritual father and pastor, I want to make sure that you're clear on the theology of this house, but also giving you a theolog theological framework and a hermeneutic so that you can clearly understand um, this issue, not in the way that, you know, it's been presented, unfortunately, by too many, but in a wholesome way. And understand how it goes back to the theme that we were talking about last week, which is the purpose for the earth. The purpose of the earth is... I just want to see who was paying attention last week. The purpose for the earth is what? Any humans in the house? Okay. So, human flourishing. So what it all boils down to when you read the biblical account, yes, it's about 
uh, the fall and rise of humanity, creation, the ordering of the universe, the introduction of God, Yahweh, and the journey of a man, Abraham, and a people, a, uh, a nation that came out of that, which led to the fulfillment of a promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15 in response to the fall of man. Yeah, redemption, salvation, um, uh, angelology, soteriology, all of those things are filled in Scripture. But the big picture, the big theme, the big picture is human flourishing. So even the return of Christ, which is to restore all things, is about restoring humanity to flourish without the presence of the undermining power of sin, the forces of evil, and of course, Satan, and those who are aligned with him in his rebellion. So the purpose of the earth is human flourishing. Everything that God put into it, he built into its foundation. Everything that the physical systems in the universe would need to sustain, to perpetuate, and he built into the foundations everything needed for the flourishing of the human person and human society at large. There are things that we haven't even discovered yet about this earth in which we live that God has prepared for us as part of human flourishing. So the purpose of the earth is human flourishing. We live in seasons and cycles and times, and they are cyclical, even though time is linear, moving in a specific direction according to the plans and purposes of God. But along that linear progression are consistent cycles that we can depend on. That is true in terms of weather, uh, the movement of the universe, so after the disruption of order, which came as a result of the flood, what does God do in his um, mandate to Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply? He assures them that the systems are in place. They won't be disrupted again. Night will follow day. There'll be winter and summer, cold and hot. So he's saying, all of the systems in place and the structures in place that you can depend on will remain intact. But not only are there weather systems there and cycles, there are social cycles, political cycles, um, economic cycles, spiritual and moral cycles as well. And discerning the times is discerning these cycles. And where we are right now is in a period of the beginning of renewal. Often it's referred to as revival, but it's actually renewal. Renewal. And that too is cyclical, and it's God's response to the spiritual, moral, political, social, and economic conditions of a society. The prophetic is predictive to the future. The prophets would predict the future. But first, it was analytical to the present. The prophet would analyze the spiritual, social, political, economic, and moral conditions of society, get a word from God, and then speak it into the society. That is also true of your personal life, right? You live life cyclically. You live life on levels. We move linear. And there are seasons where God will bring a word to your particular life or situation, right? And that word would bring or start the process of renewal. And renewal, as I said last week, is a reawakening of three things. And if you don't give them to me in the right order and with accuracy, I'm leaving. I'm going home. I'm going to barbecue and just chill for the rest of my Sunday. So, renewal is a reawakening of passion, purpose, and vision. Thank you. 
Thank you. You're incredible students of the Word. And you come here to learn, right? That's why you're here. You want to learn, grow, fellowship, worship together, all of that. But it's about learning. And personal development is based on two things. Study and reflection. Come on. Study and reflection. What else? Come on. Study and reflection. So we study, we dig, we search, we seek understanding. That's all part of studying. We get all of the resources to study aids to help us along the way. And we spend the day reflecting on the things that we study. We study not just ac academically from textbooks, but we study through observation, observation of people, of life, of circumstances and situations, and gaining meaning. We interpret the things that we experience. Interpretation is called hermeneutic, or the principle of interpretation is called hermeneutic. How many of you were um, students in my Invisible War class, spiritual warfare class? Raise your hand, students. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so you're familiar with the word and the term hermeneutic. There is biblical hermeneutics, which is the interpretation of Scripture, right? The proper interpretation of Scripture. And to interpret something, you need to have certain rules, certain principles that guide you. There is historical hermeneutic. Hermeneutic applies to anything that we are interpreting. So biblical hermeneutic has a set of principles that guide it. We're going to tap into that today as we talk about the tithe, tithing and offering, tithes and offering. And the reason we're talking about it is because of the current confusion created by, you know, this conversation around its legitimacy or whether it falls under law or grace. That seems to be the conversation. It's, it's under the law, it's under grace, and it's neither. And we'll talk about why and how we understand it. Because the real question, we may use theological language to sound spiritual, law or grace, but it's really where, what we're asking is, is it an obligation or an option? Come on, let's call it what it is. Hello. That's what we're boiling it down to, right? Because if it's law, it's demand. You're obligated. If it's grace, I've got an option, right? Let me say up front, I've got a problem with people who have to come up with a theology to justify their desire to not give money. Just don't give it. All right, don't try to make yourself spiritual and right by creating some theology around it or finding some biblical, you know, <laughs> uh, defense. Uh, just don't give it. All right, and lose out on the promise associated with it, plain and simple. All right, because whether people are religious or not, spiritual or not, know Jesus or not, if they're successful, one of the things that characterizes their success is generosity. Successful people are generous. They're philanthropic. They understand certain laws and principles that are universal, and they work. They work. So they engage those principles to their benefit. Amen? Because God causes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He causes his good rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Because that's out of his nature, which is goodness. God is good. Amen? So, and he loves the world. Did you all get that far? John 3, 16? God so loved the world. So out of his goodness, he projects that goodness towards humanity at large. Even those who are in rebellion against him, he still, because that's who he is, he still extends his favor and his goodness. Not in the same way as he does to someone who is in a special relationship with him through Jesus Christ. So there is a distinction. Amen? And two different destinies. I just thought I'd throw that in there. That was free. Two different destinies. So as we approach this, I want to approach it theologically for you and hermeneutically. 
But first, I want to talk about the big picture, the big picture. And that's always important because we are in a the next 10 years in our nation and around the world, but especially in our nation. We're going to see the conversions of cyclical, political, social, spiritual and moral forces converging in a way that we haven't seen in 80 to 100 years in our nation. And whenever that's happened, whenever that happens, all right, it's less about who's in power and it's more about what forces are at work. Are you hearing me? Because things happen while Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter who's in power, there are forces at work, underlying forces at work that are shaping society that are shaping our experience, our social experience. Got it? Does it matter who's in power? Yes, to a certain degree. But no matter who's in power, there are certain forces that are at work. And we're going to see these forces converge. So let's start with the big picture. There is a passage of scripture. For, like, well, we got human flourishing. Okay, that, that's important. Because God wants you to prosper and be in health. How many believe that? Yeah, yeah. So growth, human flourishing, and to flourish means to grow and develop in a healthy and vigorous way, especially in the right environment for growth. How many know every environment is not favorable to growth? Absolutely. So you want to make sure that you are conscious of the environment that you're in. And, a, and an environment for growth, a favorable environment for growth, doesn't mean that there's no conflict. Because remember, I talked about crisis, right? For us, crisis is good. All right, for me, crisis is good. <laughs> because we grow through crisis. Think about it. Crisis is a turning point for better or worse. And the choice is yours. Crisis moves us from the temporary to the permanent, from the temporal to the eternal, from the lesser to the greater, from the transient to the permanent. Crisis. So all forward movement in our lives that have been significant has been by way of some crisis. Is that true? Absolutely. That is true. It's like all true joy is born of sorrow. So the kingdom of God is about human flourishing, just like the purpose of the earth is about human flourishing, because Jesus came, he said, I came that you might have what? Come on, life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So the prosperity of the soul is critical because it builds the support for all other prosperity. I'm going to say that again. The prosperity of your soul, the growth and development of your soul is critical because it becomes the support for all other growth, productivity, and prosperity. Because your gift, talents, and abilities can take you to heights that only character can sustain and people have gone to great heights without developing their soul without the character to support it and they up and end up in the news and we read about it correct so let's talk about the big picture the big picture in matthew 16 18 jesus says on this rock I will build my church. Got it? And today we're looking at New King James Version. That will be the text that we will, we will stay with. He said, I will what? Build my church. So when you hear the word build, you're thinking about a process over time. Right? What is he going to build? His church. Ecclesia. It means uh, a gathering, an assembly. And he's going to take out of the world people who are going to submit 
to his lordship and walk in fellowship with him. I just summed up. You need to, you need to get that. What is he gathering? He's gathering people who are submitted to his lordship, right? And walking in fellowship with him. Everything that we experience, such as success, prosperity, health, wealth, whatever it is, happiness, joy, these are not aims, they're byproducts. They are byproducts of being submitted to his lordship and walking in fellowship with him. Which means that when your fellowship with him is not tight, when your obedience to him is not right, it's going to affect the byproducts. Very, very important. So the big picture, he said, I will build my church. So he's building this entity within human society, submitted to him, walking in fellowship with him, and experiencing the blessing that comes with that. He said, I will build my church. And then he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That immediately says there's going to be opposition. Are you hearing me? Not only opposition for him, but opposition for all those who are part of this project. So not only will the gates of hell try to resist the church, but believers. So there's going to be opposition, there's going to be antagonism. He also said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is his message. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. The lordship of Christ and fellowship with Christ. It leads to salvation and a better life. The word world there is in the Greek, the word cosmos, which means social order, which means all of its institutions, its values, etc. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Bring the love, life, and light of Christ to the society. The society is made up politically, socially, spiritually, morally, and economically. Which means that this entity called the church is designed to influence society spiritually, morally, socially, politically, economically. Can I get a half an amen? amen? We're here to influence society with the kingdom of God, God's way of doing and being, God's ordering of society. We're here to influence society. And when I say politically, let me be careful here. All right, well, I'll wait till I get, I'll get back to that. So we're here to influence society and all of these elements within society that make up society. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, which means that there'll be forces pushing back against our influence. In fact, there will be forces at work to weaken our influence. Jesus said, if the salt loses its savor, its flavor, it's good for nothing but to be trampled underfoot and cast out. And he was talking to his people. If we lose our influence, we're good for nothing. So there will be forces pushing back against us. So it makes sense to me that the devil will try to weaken the church's influence. Spiritually, morally, politically, socially, and economically. Does that make sense? The devil's going to push back. He's going to push back, right? He's going to try everything he can to weaken the church's influence. So how does he do it morally? Scandal. By... Scandal, especially amongst church leaders. 
Are you hearing me? Whether it's scandal because of sexual impropriety, whether it's scandal because of financial impropriety, whether it's scandal for abuse of power, abuse of people, whatever it is, he tries to weaken the church's influence by bringing scandal because God has also chosen human beings who are wounded and broken to carry out his perfect plan and represent the church. So one of the ways that the devil weakens is by scandal. And for 2,000 years, the church has experienced scandal. If you know any of the history, if I don't know the history, well, how about two weeks ago? In the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, in the last two years, we have had situations where leaders were found in scandal. Amen? And the way the world works is you can have 10 leaders, nine of them without scandal doing well, and one in scandal, and all the focus will be on the one and not the nine. Right? Scandal. Let me check my list. I don't want to miss anybody. Infighting. Infighting. Where there's conflict within the body of Christ. Where there's conflict within the religious body. We've seen that here in our nation. Especially around politics, which is another way that the devil weakens or tries to weaken the influence of the church politically through political idolatry where we worship a political party more than we do Jesus. This is good preaching. I don't know if you recognize this. Come on. We've seen it here in our nation, and not only in our nation, it happens in other nations, but we've seen it here in American society over the last five, six years. Over the last ten years. We've seen political idolatry where our worship and commitment is more to a political party than to God. Can we talk? I have not seen ever than what I've witnessed in the last five years. I have not seen such collective denial of the obvious. I haven't seen it. I mean, where it's right in front of you and you're saying that's not there, it's not there. And it comes from the political idolatry that we're guilty of. So the devil uses that. What does he do? He's trying to weaken the influence of the church. Compromise. Assimilation into the culture without distinction from the culture. In other words, he, Jesus said we're in the world but not of the world. And instead, the devil's got us being in and of without any distinction. Because we should be living the Christian difference. We'll try that one more time. We should be living the Christian difference. Amen? But if we look so much like the world that there's no longer a distinction, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Another way that the devil wants to weaken the church is through economic disempowerment. If he could interfere with the resources, the support mechanism, the support systems and beliefs, that fuel the church's work, then he can weaken the church economically. Because the church is an organization that needs money in order to function. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Y'all are scaring me. I only 20 people clapping. You didn't know it takes money? You're sitting in here comfortable as ever while it's 96 degrees out crossing your legs because you got air conditioning and you're sitting in a comfortable chair looking cute that took money don't get holy on me Turn your neighbor and say, don't upset the man. <laughs> I don't need any more collective denial of the obvious.
So when you begin to, to address, supposedly theologically, the systems that God put in place to support ministry, the kingdom of God, and the church, that begins to affect the influence of the church within society. Amen? Amen. So, this is where we are. And this whole issue of law and grace concerning tithe and offering, more so the tithe. And tithe simply means tenth. And there's a reason why it's tenth. And we're going to explore it. Hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. It's not just the scripture or the text, but it's also what does it mean? Because there's what the scripture says and what the scripture means. Some is obvious, but some requires a deeper understanding and study. And that's why those of you who are in my spiritual warfare class, I gave you a hermeneutic framework. Remember? Okay, let me introduce it here. An acronym. How many remember Patak Slip? Okay. So when you read a scripture, and you have to be careful, well, let me go through this real quick. Purpose. If you don't know the purpose behind something, you're going to abuse it. My dear friend and brother, for many, many years, Dr. Miles Monroe introduced a principle years ago, and it was a wonderful principle. He simply said, when the purpose of a thing is not clearly understood, abuse is inevitable. I'm going to say it again. If the purpose of a thing is not clearly understood, abuse or abnormal use, come on, abuse is what? Inevitable. Inevitable. You're going to abuse it. Right? That's for anything in life. Anything in life. Everything has purpose. If, a, if the purpose of a husband is not clearly understood, <laughs> abuse is inevitable. If the purpose of a wife is not clearly understood, if the purpose of children is not clearly understood, if the purpose of a pastor is not clearly understood, yeah, there's pastor abuse. So purpose is critical. The purpose of the Bible as a whole, the purpose of that particular book that you're reading in the Bible, the purpose of that particular chapter in that book, you've got to know its purpose. So you've got to know things like purpose, theme, audience is critical. Who is it speaking to? Does it apply to us today or does it apply only to that particular audience? And who is that audience? Context, critical. How many times have you heard Somebody say, well, no, you took my words out of context. What did they mean? In other words, you extracted it from the context that would give an understanding of what I was trying to say. And you took it and let it stand on its own so it's misinterpreted. It's misunderstood. Context is critical. Supportive text. And when you're talking about biblical understanding, you can't take a, a, a Bible verse, any, any verse you want, and use it any way you want. Especially if you're supporting a particular way of thinking, doctrine, theme, or idea. You have to have other supportive scriptures. So if it says something about healing here, you need to find what else it says about healing. If it speaks, it speaks about prosperity here, you need to find out what else it says about prosperity. Family, whatever it may be. So you need supportive text. Language, the original language. 
In our language, we say love, it's L-O-V-E, right? But there's a difference between me loving my wife and me loving to eat. Amen? There's a difference. But we only have one word. And in the original languages, like, the, like in the Greek language, there are four different words to express the one word that we use for love. So you have to examine the language. And also, prejudice. Because when we come to the text, we can bring, bring our personal prejudices to it. And when we bring our personal prejudices to it, guess what? We can come up with the wrong interpretation. And that creates crisis within the society. Conflict and even a civil war. Don't let that one slip by you. So when we think about the tithe, got it? We have to think about two things very critical. Audience and context. Audience and context. Audience and context. There is something else when you're interpreting scripture, trying to understand the text in terms of what it's saying. There's something called The law of first mention. It's very, very important. In other words, when you're trying to figure out what a word means, theologically or doctrinally, if you're trying to figure out what an idea is theologically or doctrinally, the law of first mention simply says, find the first place in the Bible where the word appears or where the, where the thought appears, or the idea appears. Find the first place. Because when you go back to the first use of it, it usually clarifies for us what the interpretation is, what the meaning is. Usually. Not always, but usually. What's it called? So you go find out where it's first mentioned in the Bible. Does that make sense? Because the idea is that, that, that the Bible's first mention of a concept is the simplest and clearest presentation. And it gives a more accurate reading. So to fully understand any complex idea, anything, you want to go back to where it's first mentioned. So the tithe is first mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis, chapter 14, with Abram. Y'all heard of Abraham? How many got that far in the Bible? Thank you. Glad you're reading. See, your job is to read the Bible through in a year and then repeat it every year. So when you come here and I make reference, you know what I'm talking about. Got it? So... The first place we find the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, which means tenth, is with Abram, Abraham. I'm going to say Abraham, okay? In Genesis chapter 14. And just write it down because I want to keep moving. I've got 60 minutes of material in three minutes. Chapter 14, verse 17 and 20. So Abraham is returning from a successful military campaign. He's the victor. He won. And in those days, all right, the military campaigns had a practice. Whatever the spoils of war were, a percentage of that was offered to their deity, their God, through the temple in honor of the king or the leader. Did you hear that? So in that text, remember, audience and context. So the context is war, a victorious military battle 
and Abraham wins. So he comes back and he meets someone named Melchizedek who is identified as the priest of the Most High God, the priest of Yahweh. Melchizedek comes to Abraham with bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? Communion Sunday, folks. It is the belief that this Melchizedek is what is called a Christophany or an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Offering communion, which is covenant. Because remember, what did God do with Abraham? He made a covenant with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. So Abraham wins the war. And Abraham is conscious that his victory is because God was with him. Got it? So he receives communion, but then he pays tithes. In other words, he takes a tenth of all that he brought back as a result of his victory, and he offers it to his God, Yahweh. Are you with me? That's the context. Audience. I'm pointing to the board, Patak Slip, audience. The question is not how we understand this today. The question is how did they understand it back in the ancient world? We can't superimpose modern thinking on what took place thousands of years ago. The audience of that was the ancient world. So the question is, how did they understand it? Not how do you understand it? How do I understand it in 2022? How did they understand it? I'm glad you asked. They understood it as a custom practice by all military within every society. In other words, the Babylonians practiced it. The Phoenicians practice it, the Sumerians practice it, the Grecians practice it, those from Mesopotamia practice it, the Egyptians practice it, the Romans practice it. Are you hearing me? If you read the interpretations of cuneiform writings, it's written in there where a tenth was given of the spoils in war to the deity, the God that they worship, through the temple. You go to British Museum, you'll see the historical records, the same thing. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the sacred writing, the same thing. There's record of this activity. So what Abraham was doing had nothing to do with the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses wasn't given. It had nothing to do with the doctrine of grace because that came through Jesus. Even though God was gracious all along, but grace as a doctrine was not present. Grace was not associated with Abraham. Neither was the law associated with Abraham. What was associated with Abraham is one word which we live by today and is the foundation for the tithe. It's called faith. Tithing is not an act of grace or law. It's an act of That's why when you read about the tithe in the book of Malachi chapter 3, where it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, saith the Lord, and see if I will not open you the what? Windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. It is an action associated with a promise. And it continues. Not only did he promise to bless you, he said, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So I'm going to bless you and I'm going to protect the blessing that I bless you with. So it's an offer that we respond to in what? Come on. They did it in ancient civilizations in the ancient world to honor their gods. It is an offering of thanksgiving for their God being with them. 
They did it to express freedom from fear and covetousness. Because when you give people the option, they tend to opt out. <laughs> Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know. I don't have to pay? Yes. <laughs> this is why Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. The first fruit is what was offered to the deity, to the God, for their protection as well as provision. Thanksgiving, an expression of gratitude and an investment in the kingdom of God. That's why one of the characteristics of successful people is generosity. Successful people are generous. They give. They understand the principle. Give and it... Institutions offer you incentives. They'll give you a pen, a new calculator if you open an account. <laughs> Isn't it true? Why? Because they understand human nature is reciprocal. We are reciprocal by nature. So when you do something to us or for us, we want to give something in return or do it back to you. <laughs> We're reciprocal in nature. So give, and it shall be what? Given. This is a principle. This is a law. So what they did was out of faith. It wasn't out of fear or terror or anything like that. Let me... Oh, this is good. Can I share this with you? Oh, we're out of time, though. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Did you ever read that in Psalm 24? You never see a U-Haul following a hearse. I'm going to give you the big secret. You can't take it with you. Which means we are possessors of nothing but stewards of everything. Write it down. We are possessors of nothing but stewards of everything. You got that? God gives us stewardship responsibility over our time. Whatever you do with it, that's on you. You can waste it. You can't save time. You can only use it. But you can't waste it. Your time is your life. Waste time, you're wasting your life. We have a stewardship responsibility over our time. We have a stewardship responsibility over our talent. God has given you a talent. He's given you a gift. You have the stewardship responsibility over it. To develop it. To grow it. And then translate it into value in the marketplace so you can get paid for it and pay the rent. He gave you stewardship responsibility over your time, your talent, and your treasury. Your money. And he gave you stewardship responsibility over your relationships. So all relationships that you have are not yours. They provide a stewardship responsibility opportunity. That wife is not yours. You don't possess her. You don't own her. She is a stewardship responsibility given to you by God for which you will be judged. That husband is not your possession. Those children are not your possession. 
They are your stewardship responsibility. Are y'all getting that? Come on, give God a good hand clap offering. In some societies, it wasn't a tenth. It was one-sixth, which is 16% instead of 10%. That was given back in honor of their God. Even the tithe was not exact because, remember, in those days, they dealt with prox approximation as opposed to precision. So it was approximately 10%. Got it? In Hebrew, the number 10 relates to the Hebraic number, all right, or should I say letter, Yod. Y-O-D is pronounced Yod. Y-O-D. That number 10 symbolizes the hand of God. It serves as a message that God's hand is always present to catch us if we fail, but not to push us into a direction outside of our own choices. So the tenth or the tithe symbolizes God's provision and his hand providing for us and protecting us and yet giving us the freedom to choose what we're going to do with our lives. So it was called the sacred tenth because it belonged to God. And we had the responsibility to give back to him out of our free will. Not out of compulsion, not out of some legal obligation, but out of our free will. How many understand what I'm talking about here? I tithe because I've seen the blessing that comes with it. And, and I'll just share with you. I said it and forget it. Which simply means it comes out of my paycheck. Yeah, I get a paycheck, y'all. I look forward every other Thursday. It comes out. And I don't even think about it until a day like this. Like I'm talking about it. I don't think about it until when I'm filing my taxes because then it comes up as part of my philanthropic giving for the year. So it's factored in. Otherwise, I don't think about it. So, you see, because if you, if you don't set it and forget it, your human nature kicks in and every week you're going to be wrestling every Sunday. <laughs> it disciplines you to live on the rest after you've honored God without thinking about it. And I have seen the blessing that is associated with giving. We have never wanted in our life. And I will tell you, there were times, and, and you've heard my story, and I'm going to close with this because I've got to stop here. The story of when, when Pastor Karen and I were struggling because when I got saved... I had to cut some things out of my life that were income generating. <laughs> Did I say that good or what? <laughs> I had to change my product line. So. <laughs> so with that income being cut I discovered what I was making working at the bank <laughs> there was no longer any supplement and we struggled and we had to make do and I mean there were times when we were trusting God week to week to eat and it was a wonderful time of trusting God when we went shopping, we went to three different supermarkets because each one of, them, one of them had a different sale on what we needed. I wish, every, I wish it was all at one. We found out how much, how much meat was on a turkey neck. 
because we could that's all we could afford to buy. I was so happy that Pastor Karen's father was a chef and that she picked it up in the jeans. He taught her how to cook out of all of her siblings. She's the one he made learn how to cook. And I knew that was for me. God was looking ahead. We ate chicken backs, five pounds for a dollar. If you know anything about chicken backs, but the way she fried those babies up. There was one, I, I never forget this, one week we had nothing and we didn't tell anybody. We were embarrassed and we were, we were trusting God. All of a sudden, one of the members of the church that we were in brought us 20 pounds of hot dogs that were left over from a food drive at the church. She didn't know what we were going through. She just figured we could use it. She was right. <laughs> we took those 20 pounds of hot dogs, and for a month, we had hot dogs. We fried it, sauteed it, con guisada. Arroz con habichuela y... We stewed those babies. We, we know how to make, we know what to do with a hot dog. And we lasted through that period of time. So we know what it is to abase. We know what it is to abound. And no matter what state we found ourselves, we learned to trust God and believe in God. And we tithe. And we invested in the kingdom. And we gave offering. And we saw God come through. We saw that tent where represents the hand of God, his provision and his protection come into our lives and bring resources to us we did not imagine were available to us because we didn't tell anybody. We know it works. So if you don't believe it, it's on you. But the rest of us, as for me and my house, we're going to take God up on his offer. Open those windows of heaven. Pour out that blessing on me, Lord. That I don't have room enough to contain it. And when the devourer comes to steal from me, rebuke him. That's his promise. And he's left it up to us to choose. Come on, Sam. You know, the Apostle Paul said something so beautiful. He said, what if some don't believe? Does it make our faith ineffective? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God just wants us to trust him. And that's our life. All of this other stuff is a byproduct, not the aim. Our success, our prosperity, our wealth, our health, all of that is a byproduct of submission to Christ and walking in fellowship with him. Ella Beverly is going to now lead us in an opportunity for those of you who don't know Jesus, who haven't surrendered to his lordship, whether you're in this building or whether you're watching us online, this is your opportunity. Praise God. It is time for you who have not embraced Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's time, a great opportunity for you to say, yes, Lord. Today, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. If you're in the sanctuary, or even watching by way of internet, I advise you to take this opportunity to embrace Jesus, get in fellowship with him, so you can begin to experience 
how I can flourish when I am in relationship with him. So if that's you, I'm speaking to just raise your hand in the sanctuary. Praise God. You are on internet. I just want you to do something with me. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Today. Today. I accept you. I accept you. As my Lord. And my Savior. I renounce. My plans. And my provision. And today. I call you. Lord and Savior of my life. Now, I see one hand in the building. There may be others. Those of you who are on Internet, there is a number on the screen. You can text or call. We have ministers waiting available to minister to you to encourage you on your spiritual journey. And those of you who are coming back, to Christ, we want to say, welcome home. Mm. Recognize that the journey now will be greater. And we will follow up with you to give you to know you are not alone. We are yet connected because we are in fellowship. God bless you and welcome to the family of God. Amen. 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 You need to get into a church. You need to be part of a spiritual family, a spiritual community. We don't grow in isolation. We only grow in community. Amen. Community of shared values. We're all on the same journey at different levels, at different places along the way. Levels of growth and maturity and experience. But we're still all together on the same journey. So thank you for being with us today. Did you get anything out of today's message? Amen. And those of you who joined us by way of internet, thank you for being with us again. Let's say something good as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you. I love you. Have a wonderfully blessed week in the Lord. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.